Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel, Kim and Chris. On today's French Open semi-finals catch-up, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. Mukova saves match point to make the final. Eager set for her title defence. And Novak Djokovic goes for number 23. Chris, today is the 9th of June. We are here to catch up on the semi-finals of the French Open here at Tennis Weekly HQ. Uh, lots to talk about. Uh, the semi-finals have been a, a bit of a mixed bag, it's fair to say. Um, and, well, we're not joined by Joel today. He's been off enjoying the grass courts of Southwest London down in Surbiton. Uh, he got the chance, actually, to speak with Andy Murray in press today, uh, who is in to the semi-finals down in Surbiton. So, repping it for the podcast down in Surbiton. We are here, though, to talk all things Roland Garros semifinals. Have you recovered from all your tennis watching over the last few days, Chris? Are you ready to, to delve into the action on court? Well, I was just going to apologise for not being Andy Murray, that you don't get the chance <laughs> to speak to him, whereas Joel did. You have to put up with me instead. But uh, no, I've been, oh, it's, been a, it's been difficult watching, hasn't it, Kim? It's not all been easy viewing for the men's semi-finals that's for sure and I think we've had some thrilling moments in the women's semi-finals with match points being saved and you know upsets happening I think that's been really exciting but for the men's final I think I was pulling my hair out a bit today it was almost watched from behind a pillow yeah, I think a lot of people might have actually turned over to watch Andy Murray against Jason Kubler uh, in Surbiton. I think it was on the BBC and they might have thought, actually, that's the I'll better match. The grass. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll be rounding up Surbiton a bit more, you know, see what happens over the weekend. There are three Brits uh, in into the, the women's semis, which is really fantastic so um yeah joel's been soaking up uh the action uh there so you know that that's for another time and, and place um we will obviously be getting on to to roland garros um big match big well big surprise though chris actually forget you know about you know djokovic and kasper rude and carolina mukova kim Kleisters and caroline wozniacki knocked out the Italian pair in the uh, women's legends doubles. And that, that was a big surprise, wasn't it? We can't even get the legends predictions right, Kim. <laughs> what hope do we have for the main event? Is it because you wore your Danish football shirt for Caroline Wozniacki? Is Thank that what goodness the Danes a got a win this weekend. Yeah. That's all I can say. Because Wozniacki's not, not famous for her doubles play. That's for sure. She's going to go deeper than Holger Rune in uh, whatever competition she is in. I'm not sure how it works because they're all swapping partners, Kim. So, oh, I yeah. So I think maybe it's a round <laughs> robin points tally. I really can't be sure, but either way, um, we did get that wrong. Panetta and Schiavone did not do the Italians justice in that one. So, well done to Kleisters and Wojnacki. Yes, and I guess we do need to get on to the uh, the main action from from Roland Garros. Um, where do we start? I mean, let's start with today's action. The, the men's semi-finals let's start with that that big highly anticipated encounter between Carlos Alcaraz and Novak Djokovic it was good for a time the first two sets I think lived up to the billing somewhat but it all went a bit sour after that didn't it Chris um in those final two sets and the end result is that we have Novak Djokovic into yet another Grand Slam final and he is now one win away from getting the most uh, singles Grand Slams ever uh, in the Open era. Um, and he will have the chance to play for that on Sunday. Yeah, he will. And it's a very, it was a, one of the strangest matches I've ever watched, I have to say, in terms of having such a fantastic and competitive first two sets. It was teed up for an epic. And I think some of the tennis and some of the highlights were unbelievable. Um, some of the shot making from Alcaraz and even though he obviously didn't get the win and there's so much disappointment with the fact that his body wasn't able to hold up today um, there are some hugely significant and incredible points that show just what his potential is so there are some silver linings but I was absolutely gobsmacked when at the start of that third set at one all he f conceded not only the game the point he, he was currently um, playing but also the next game and I think that was something that really shocked me because I was aware that there are some strange rules around cramping 
but it is very odd when you watch it in a semi-final of a slam and you feel like there's got to be a bit of flex on some of the rules there because he essentially was um, kind of forced out of the competition in the sense that he couldn't have the medical timeout because it was cramp. Yeah, I mean, so for any listeners who maybe aren't fully aware, you know, it was one set or one game all in the third set and, and Carlos Alcaraz just started started to cramp in his right calf. Um, I wasn't actually sure that it was cramp at first because it sort of seemed to happen as he was sort of running after playing a shot. And then I wasn't sure if he just sort of like tweaked a muscle or something or if it was sort of his knee. Jarred his knee is what people seem to think at the time, yeah. I think. So I was a bit shocked when, you know, um, I saw him obviously having that medical timeout and then they walked back onto court and it was suddenly, you know, Djokovic was 2-1 up with a break. And I thought, oh, OK, he's had to forfeit that game. Um, I remember WhatsApping you at the time, Chris, and I was like, this is really unfair. And you said, well, hang on, the rule book says, you know, if it's cramp, you you can't um, just take a medical timeout. You have to wait for the changeover. So, you, you know, he chose to forfeit that game. He knew what was going to happen. Um, and it must have been really bad to obviously have to go straight to, to get treatment. But often we see players kind of get treatment and they sort of can play on and it's not maybe too bad or they can play their way into it. But he just seemed to remain in this situation of being unable to chase down his shots um, and just not not able to to play his tennis. And he just got whooped in those third and fourth sets, you know, 6-1, six, 6-1. One, six, one. It was almost, um, I was thinking, is if it's that bad, why, why does he not retire? Um, put us all out of our misery. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Um, and for anyone who isn't aware of some of the the rules that there are around medical timeouts for cramping, um, you're allowed to have treatment on two complete changeovers for cramping or heat-related illness. Um, but this is not necessarily an injury-related piece. This is about the, your body holding up and therefore you aren't able to take a medical timeout. Um, and this was actually brought in because of people abusing this. Um, and that was why they tried to make sure that people weren't able to abuse this. And if you are, for example, um, it's on your opponent's service game and the, the changeover happens after that, then you have to concede the game. And so he knew that immediately. And it was almost like as soon as that injury happened, he was well aware of, of how he was going to try and manage it. Um, and for someone who was in that sort of situation, I do think it was very impressive to me that he knew, right, I'm going to have to forfeit this one. I need to get the medical advice. I need to figure out what's happening here. And then even when he took sort of a bathroom break, it was obviously also to get some form of treatment as well. Um, so he did his best to try and kind of hang in there and complete the match. And you have to say that there's something very valiant about that. And Djokovic did mention that in his, um, uh, in his post-match press conference. And I think it is very impressive that he did stay on court, but it was, it was very hard to watch because it was not a contest and um, Djokovic didn't have to play particularly well in those last two sets because it wasn't really competitive at all. And um, it's such a sad way for him to go out. And I think there's a lot of, well, a lot of parallels for me with the way that um, Zverev went out last year, you know, it was locked in that second set, very, very competitive, could have gone either way. Um, and then kind of an injury determined the semi-final result. And it's a big shame because Alcaraz, Djokovic was really billed as the event of the tournament and for two sets it was but the actual whole event was actually very disappointing yeah it really fizzled out and obviously this will be a big learning curve for Carlos Alcaraz I think he has since said that you know he was very stressed and, and anxious about the, the prospect of, of this match and the, I think the tension essentially caused his his body to cramp and you know that sort of thing will come with more experience and playing you know I was going to, you know, the top players at, at a Grand Slam. This is the first time he's had to play Novak Djokovic at a Grand Slam. And I guess, you know, there was all this hype in the media building up to this point. And I guess his body just failed him today. And it is a real shame because, you know, even Djokovic at the end of um, the match was saying at the second set, you know, the end of the, that second set, he wasn't feeling great. He wasn't feeling fresh. Um, he also had had his own uh, bit of medical treatment on his on his forearm on his elbow area so I, I don't know if Djokovic had a, a slight issue we have obviously seen him <laughs> sort of have medical timeouts before and he's been absolutely fine but you know it did seem like it was really poised to potentially become a classic you know after that second set and it just you know the, this like with Zverev last year when he had to sort of retire all of a sudden it you know obviously Alcaraz was respectful enough to sort of play on and, and fight through um maybe he should have just 
withdrawn. I don't think he wanted to to do that. I think he said he would have regretted that. But yeah, just for for different reasons. Obviously, it is a it has been a disappointment. Um, interesting that some players have come out in in kind of Alcaraz's defence. We've had Nick Kyrgios piping up on Twitter um, as he want he wants to. <laughs> As he wants to do, but you know, he said that cramping due to like nervous energy and the anxiety of playing a match with this magnitude, like it's, it's something that if he said every tennis player has sort of had. And you know, obviously, Kyrgios played the Wimbledon final against Novak Djokovic last year, so he's been in situations of of you know this sort of magnitude before, and it's something that I'm sure Alcaraz will learn to to deal with. Um, it's just a shame that we didn't get that big match up that you know everyone was hoping for. Yeah, and it's a very different situation. I think many um, viewers will have seen something like this before. And afterwards, when different commentators were speaking about their experience with cramp, a lot of people had had not full body cramp, like Carlos said that he had, but they had an instance where the anxiety or the excitement of the match, and that's what Carlos kind of put it down to, um, that it has actually caused them to, to cramp. And it's a very unusual thing because it's not because your body is not physically capable of going five sets because we all know that he is one of the fittest players on the tour. I mean, we saw in the US Open, he didn't want to do anything in less than five sets. So it's definitely not a physical issue in terms of his fitness. It is just a, a nervous system and, and the body's response to pressure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's, it's a big shame in that sense. But I think moving forward from this, as you say, like it is a big learning curve and I think it will be something where, you know, at the end of the day, What's the worst case if something could happen? The worst case is actually that you probably do end up having a full body cramp, you know, and not be able to play your best tennis. So hopefully there'll be a way of channel- uh, channeling that energy and that excitement into something more positive when it comes to um, the next slam or the next sort of semi final that he's in, because I'm sure there'll be many more opportunities for him. Yeah, I think he'll just need to do some work on how can he manage these feelings, manage his nerves going into, you know, situations where he is up against. Novak Djokovic I mean they might meet at Wimbledon next month he'll he'll want to be able to handle that situation a bit differently Um, I mean I'm sure on a Wimbledon court I think you know I think there would be a lot less pressure on him I think Djokovic would be the the clear favorite given obviously what's happened today and it not being kind of the clay as well Um, but yeah I think obviously going forwards Alcaraz needs to learn how to handle that it reminds me a bit of Emma Raducanu at Wimbledon um, against um, Tom Lanovic, you know, when she went off with sort of breathing issues, and I think that was part partly, you know, nerves and not being able to handle the the occasion, and it manifested in a really physical symptom. Yeah, I can see that parallel, and I think it's also a case with um, with Carlos that this is something where he was it actually looked at as being a bit of the favourite, and I think it's the U.S. Open, it was the underdog, it was that story, and as as you say with Emma Raducanu, suddenly all the attention was on her. And Tom Janovic was actually looked like a winnable match on paper. And and with this, I'm not saying that Djokovic is ever a winnable match on paper, but a lot of pundits, a lot of people were thinking this is Carlos's mm-hmm. match and he's a real shot here. So I think we'll see when it comes to, for example, the women's final, that maybe when it comes to Iga and Mukova, that it's a similar situation where there's a lot of pressure on both of them to deliver based on their performances in the tournament so far. So um it's a really real thing and they are playing in front of so many people with the world's attention on them and um they aren't they aren't super they aren't all superhuman they are real people as well you know yeah exactly um and yeah i think it's sometimes it's easy to think put them on this pedestal and think you know they're above everyday anxieties and you know we all get nervous doing certain things i get nervous when i'm got a stressful meeting at work and maybe I, I get physical symptoms so it's well, maybe why should Joel it be any different asking Andy Murray a question today I bet his heartbeat was racing I can guarantee you that <laughs> absolutely um but Djokovic is through to the final uh he's one win away from slam 23 um he actually becomes the second oldest finalist in Roland Garros history um and you know, obviously he's 36 years of age, but still going strong, defeating uh, people 16 years his junior. I mean, he could be Alcaraz's father, couldn't he? Um, but it's it's scary stuff. And Casper Ruud is going to be up against it come Sunday because he is going to be Djokovic's opponent. Um, this was a surprising match. Casper Ruud thrashing Sasha Zverev 6 3, 6 4, 6 love. Total domination. Rude makes it into the final for a second straight year. Um, 
what happened to Sasha Zverev today? I, I thought going into this that he was the favourite. I thought with a booming serve like he's got, um, he's going to have a bit too much for, for Rude. And I thought it's sort of meant to be, you know, after Sasha had to pull out last year in the semis, I thought maybe there's a story here and kind of he's going to, it's all going to work out fine and maybe he'll even lift the title. But no, um, it was not to be Rude, you know, stopping any dreams that, that Zverev may have this year. Yeah, and you mentioned the serve and Casper actually out aced Sasha. He hit five aces to Sasha's three. Sasha hit two double faults to Casper's just one. And um, some of the key numbers here would be that um, on first serve, Casper was able to win 71% of first serves to 55% for, Sa- uh, for Sasha. And I think that's something there. You look at those numbers and you think about someone who's a towering sort of giant like Zverev and his serve always should be one of the strongest parts of his game. And it hasn't always been. And in this match, it definitely disappeared, especially in that third set. And Casper obviously played a great match. Um, he returned well. He took his chances. He took six out of 10 break points. But it did feel like he didn't necessarily rise to the occasion because he did only take one of nine break points for, Zer- for Zverev. And that's something when you think about it, someone who's played at this level before, that's a stat that really will come back to haunt you. Yeah, I mean, just not his serve not being at the races. There's obviously when his serve is working, he's it's a different player, really, isn't it? Um, isn't he? And it's it's just such a shame that we were denied even kind of more of a matchup, especially after the disappointment of the the Djokovic Alcaraz match um, in the end. But you know, I think Casper Ruud as well. We need to do you know give him more justice. I think he's quite easy to overlook. You know the talents that he he does have. Um, he just does it in a slightly less, um, I guess, guess flashy way. Um, but you know he's he's got fantastic form on these courts. He's played his way into form after a disappointing clay season, um, and he's progressed through pretty easily. I mean, probably playing maybe better tennis than he did this time um, a year ago. So, and he's going to need to play his best tennis, obviously, to have any chance come Sunday. Um, and I think, I mean, just on, on Zverev as well, I think given the fact that none of us were talking about him going into the tournament, a semi-final is is also obviously a very good result and outcome. Just a shame he wasn't able Absolutely. to really perform um, perform today, you know, um, on the on the clay as, as he would like. Um, but he will defend his points from last year at the very least. Um, but Chris, uh, uh, unless you've got sort of anything more on, on this match, I just kind of want to look at ahead to the final. Do you think Kasper Rude's got any chance based on how Djokovic is playing, how Rude has been playing, how they've played against each other in the past before? Um, do you think there's any hope for Kasper Rude? Um, or do you think Djokovic has got this, you know, sewn up? Well... Based on the head-to-head, Kim, it's looking pretty ominous. Uh, you kind of drew my attention to the fact that they played four times and Casper's not won a set. So that will be something that will be in the back of your mind. And I do think that the match last year in the final, that is quite a haunting scoreline. When you play in your first slam final and you win just six games in a score that was very similar to the his semi-final result today. Um, and maybe that will help kind of put some of that... Um, some of those memories to bed, you know, really bringing your A game in the semifinals. He'll be as confident as he can be going into that match. I think the way that he's played, I've really liked the way he's been hitting his forehand with a lot of shape. Um, He's been much more aggressive than I've seen him. And I've loved the fact he's coming into volley. He's actually a very, very, very technically competent volleyer. Um, And he's not just kind of plopping the ball back into court. Like we see some singles players to set up another volley. It might take a couple to get the ball away is really punching through. And I think it's going to be key that he does move forward because Djokovic in these long points, I think we've seen uh, just how he was able to have this sort of really wily sort of points against Carlos. And it's almost felt like it was two 20 year olds playing each other. He moves so well. um, And he really does sort of win some of those attritional battles. So for me, it's a very tall order. I don't think it's something that Casper has the game necessarily for. I think Djokovic was very confident in press afterwards with his level and um, everything's pointing towards number 23. But I don't know, Kim, what do you think? <sighs> I mean, I think Casper Ruud this year should be less like overawed because he's been in two slam finals now. 
And, you know, he's very much a big fan of, of Rafa. So I think last year there was an element of, oh, I'm playing my hero on the tennis court in, in a Grand Slam final. Um, I don't think he'll have quite the same. I mean, obviously he greatly respects Djokovic. He's, he's, he's obviously one of t- the toughest asks in, in tennis. But I don't think he's going to have that sort of first time finalist jitters like he, he may have done last year. So hopefully he'll feel a bit more comfortable and mm-hmm. confident on the court. So aside from that, you know, I just think tennis alone, you know, based on their previous matchups, um, you know, Rude hasn't ever won a set against Novak. They've played twice on clay, twice on indoor hard. It's been very similar score lines, you know, the whole time. One set maybe being fairly close, a tie break 7-5, and then sort of generally, a, you know, straightforward score line in, in the other set. So I don't see it going any longer than a... I mean, if Rude won a set, I'd be... I'd be surprised. And I know that sounds quite negative, but I just think everything is pointing to Djokovic. The only thing I'm thinking that may help Rude is when Djokovic went for, was he, was he going for four in a row when he played Medvedev in that US Open final and he got a bit tight and obviously Medvedev won that one. Yeah, that was for the Grand Slam, I think. Yeah. That year. So maybe Djokovic might get slightly tight knowing he's going for the lead in the Grand Slam race. But mm-hmm. that's the only thing I could, but I, d- I don't think Rude has enough, even if Djokovic gets tight, to challenge for but the win. could he do it for Rafa, as you say? He's a big fan <laughs> of Rafa. Will he channel Rafa well... <laughs> and Rafa fans everywhere? <laughs> Rafa fans everywhere would, yeah, put Casper up on a, on a, you know, knight Casper Rude if he was able to, <laughs> to, to stop Sir Djokovic Kasper getting Rude? 23. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Djokovic is going to get 23 regardless, whether it's here or, point, yes. or Wimbledon. So, or um, the US Open or well, yeah. Australia. <laughs> He's got plenty of opportunities if he doesn't do it um, for whatever reason. But yeah, I mean... I, pleasing for Casper Rude fans though that he's made the final you know many wouldn't have thought he'd have got to that point based on you know below 16, par 11 season. this year 16-11 mm. so yeah. really no form coming into this yeah it made all our predictions much harder didn't it we sort of looked over Rude a little bit much to our peril um, and I have to say I've beaten both you and Chris uh, sorry we've both beaten I've beaten both you and Joel uh, by saying Djokovic is the winner because I think you know you'd gone for Rune Joel had gone for Alcaraz so uh, you've both yeah. got the slam yes, spoon of you, shame you for have, the yeah men. we really have because you did get Djokovic in the final for this one and you also had Iga in the final as well so on the predictions Kim I have to say you are very much the winner the slam <laughs> spoon of shame is not coming your direction so those Ottolenghi recipes will have to use a different implement from the kitchen Let's take a very quick break now, but do join us in the second half where we'll be taking a look back at all the action from the women's semi-finals at Roland Garros. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back to the Tennis Weekly Podcast, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. And now we're going to look back at the women's semi-finals from Thursday, where we did have... Yeah, one of the mo- most entertaining, best semi-finals I've seen in the women's game for a long time. Uh, Arena Sabalenka against Karolina Mukova going down to the wire. A match point saved, a comeback in the third set. It had it all 6-7, 7-6, 7-5. Mukova into her maiden Grand Slam final. Um, and she will be up against Iga Sviontek, Uh come well tomorrow uh but chris what did you make of this match it was fantastic encounter i think great showcase for women's tennis um and mukova kept her nerve and got the job done in in just over three hours an unbelievable effort i really felt like it was from mukova because sabalenka had been playing some incredible tennis going into this i think both of us thought that she would be overpowered in this one but she showed some incredible variety and she showed such a level head throughout the match in key moments, you really played the big points so well. Um, if you look at some of the the key stats from the match, uh, she won five out of five break points, whereas um, Sabalenka won four out of 13. So in terms of the big points, she did win almost all of them when it really, really mattered. Um, and that match point, she went for a winner. And I think that said so much about the way she played. She played like she'd been in this situation many times before, rather than just the one time in the semi-final. Um, in Australia. So I think it's a fantastic story for the tournament. And I think it's such a great um, 
a great kind of match because it was sort of like the the brute force of Sabalenka versus um, almost a bit of an artist on the court in terms of some of the the wizardry that she has. And I think the slices, the different top spins, she served fantastically. We saw some fantastic volleys. Um, and it really was kind of a throwback to kind of old school sort of tennis. And I think that's something that at times we do sort of miss on the tour. We ended up a bit of a slugfest at times. And I think um, it sets itself up for a really interesting final because I don't think that um, Eager's played anyone who plays much like Mukova in the tournament. And I think that can be something that really can sort of derail you. And I think for Sabalenka, it did prove to be quite challenging to keep her level up and really believe in those shots because when someone is giving you such a different ball, it's very hard to keep playing your game. Yeah, and, and Mukova plays with, you know, a lot of variety. She's she's not, you know, a one a one trick pony. She's got a lot of dimensions to her game and I think that will be quite interesting, uh, come come the final against Shriontek. And, you know, obviously um got got under Sabalenka's skin as the match went on and, and Sabalenka we did see, unfortunately for her, those sort of serving jitters of old creep creep in, um, you know, a couple of double faults being thrown in. And, you know, she only had to kind of serve out <laughs> that, that last set, didn't she, a couple of times, and she wasn't able to do it. Um, and some of those, like, old serving challenges uh, that we saw her have, you know, a year ago, uh, creeping back in, she lost her rhythm. Um, you know, she still had a great tournament getting to the semifinals, but Mukova was able to hang in there and and take advantage of that. Um, I mean, always gutting, though, to lose a match from from having that, that match point. Do you think it's going to you know, do you think Sablink is going to be thinking about this for, for a long time to come? Or do you think she'll be able to kind of put it behind her and, and sort of focus on the grass courts now? I mean, I think we've seen that she's able to bounce back pretty well. Mm. Um, and I think once you've had some of the, well, probably one of the most public sort of tennis nightmares when it came to the double fault side of things, and she now laughs about that. And I think, Yes, it will always be a bit of a challenge for her. And I think at times, even in the Australian Open final, I think it was a match point which she double faulted on or a couple of match points she double faulted on before taking the title. Um, I think she understands that some of the matches that are really close, you do end up winning. Some of them you don't. Um, And it doesn't mean that she isn't going to win another slam. And I think it's much easier to take a loss like this when you have won a slam. Um, And if you haven't, and I think it's a bit like Maria Sakari in that uh, 2021 um, semi-final against Krajikova where she really should have won that match and she didn't um, and she hasn't been able to win a slam since then whereas this is very different when you're actually coming off what is your best season so far and this is her best result at the French so it is all building and I think it sets itself up for a really interesting Wimbledon because I'd argue that grass is probably her best surface so I think she will bounce back quickly and the nature of the game is you move from clay to grass and some players are already on grass so you don't have time to dwell because Wimbledon is just around the corner. Yeah, and I think that's quite nice when you have the the two slams quite close together. Is that it's all very much? Oh, if you do lose uh, early at the French, it's oh we've got Wimbledon, we can focus on that. Yeah. You know, there's less of a lull between because you've just got to get there and start playing, and you know, not like a bad US Open. Yeah, where you have time after where, you know, there's a bit of a lull and you think about it more. I mean, just going back to Mukova as well, she has been at the semifinals of a slam before. I think it was the 2021 Australian Open. I think, did she lose that one to Ash Barty, um, that, that semifinal? I, I think, uh, possibly. But it's obviously... She's, she's, definitely, she's definitely beaten Ash Barty before. I'm not sure if she'd then lost to her the following year. And maybe she lost to Osaka. V- listeners, please correct us. But... Um, I did see something, Kim, that was very interesting, that she's actually 5-0 and um, against top five opponents, um, which is very, very impressive when it comes to her play at slams because some of those matches have been at really key moments. And I think she's um, also got a 100% record against top 10 players at slams. Uh, so I think if the stats are to go by, this would be as tricky a prospect as Eager could face because she is a giant killer in that sense. That's a very impressive statistic. If I was Eager, I'd be quaking in my boots at that. Um, yeah, I've just, sorry, I've just looked up that 2021 Australian Open. This was the year it was played in February because of the COVID delay, I guess. Um, and 
Mook of a beat Barty in the quarterfinal. And then I'd completely forgotten this person got to the final, lost to Jennifer Brady in three sets. Goodness, um, I forgot that happened too. So <laughs> we, we were both wrong in that one. What happened to Jennifer Brady? Has she been out? She, she was injured? injured and yeah, oh. out injured. And she was on an entry list early this year, but then she wasn't able to play. She was actually on the entry list for Roland Garros, but wasn't able to play. So I think she's oh. mounting a comeback, but she was had a very unfortunate injury. Gosh, yeah, I d- completely bypassed that in my brain. Um, but yeah, so Mukova, it, it's been a long time coming. And obviously it's been, was it three years ago? I did predict she would win Roland yeah, Garros. So I'm so this, totally claiming this if it happens. <laughs> um, exactly. But I mean, regardless, this was an absolute fantastic um, spectacle, this match. It, it was great stuff, really exciting. Definitely the best semi that we've seen uh, across the board. I think this tournament... Uh, definitely not a letdown like some of the maybe the men's matches today and you know Mukova at the end very emotional on the court you know she was thinking back to when she had to you know withdraw last year uh, retiring injured being um taken off court in the third round here so to make the, the final of a year later that's just such a lovely uh sort of comeback story and uh maybe she can go all the way she will have a tough ask, won't she? Because she will be up against Iga Svantec, who will be going for her title defence here. And she came through in straight sets against uh, Beatrice Haddad Meyer. It was 6 2 7 6. So quite a one sided first set. But that second set, Haddad Meyer, um, you know, having to, taking it to a tie break, but just narrowly missing out. Yeah, I mean, that it was closer than I thought it would be based on just how much tennis had admired played coming into this. I really did think it would be too much of an ask, kind of really be as competitive. I thought that she would have to really hope to get the first set um, and to kind of be a bit more aggressive than she has been in the tournament because from a legs perspective, she obviously played the day before. That's the nature of the women's semifinals is that depending on when you play, you then have to come back. And that is a challenge for some players, but Although Iga did get the win, it was not one of Iga's best performances. Um, And I don't think it's one where in the US Open last year, she grew into the tournament, started playing much better tennis in the semifinals, and the final played very well against Ons. But her serve is being a little bit of a problem um, this tournament. And she only made kind of 61% of first serve. She did win a lot of those points, but she did hit four double faults as well. And It definitely was the case where her winners and unforced errors, it was 25 winners, 26 unforced errors. So it wasn't the cleanest of games. And I think from the stats we saw in the savalenka Mukova match that there was a much more positive differential there. So it wasn't the cleanest. She found a way to win. Um, And I think we've seen that, you know, Iga is able to bring her best game in finals. And that's one of the best records she does have is in finals. But in terms of who's going to this with the most confidence, I think... I would think that Mukova has nothing to lose in this one. I think that um, when it comes to Iga, I think we think the pressure question is also there because who would bet against her for this based on the form book and being a two-time champion, uh, being world number one for over a year now, I think it really does set itself up to be the targets on um, Iga's back in. And that can go one of two ways when you have that pressure like we saw with Carlos. And it's going to be really interesting to see because we do really have an underdog versus the most dominant number one we've had in a few years. So I think it's um it's going to be a really interesting prospect, Kim. Yeah, you just don't know if Mukova's going to really embrace and relish this opportunity and go for it because like you said, she doesn't have anything to lose really. But will she have, you know, first time finalist nerves, which we have seen, you know, afflict so many players. I, I think, I mean, although she wasn't a first time um, finalist, I think of how Pliskova was in the Wimbledon final. She was so slow off the mark, just couldn't, you know, play her tennis at all. And then it took her a while to kind of get into the match. Um, and in the end, it, you know, kind of made a bit more of a match of it. But I, I hope Mukova, if she is going to get all nervous, um, you know, first time final nerves, that it's it doesn't, you know, take too long for her to sort of get past that because we've seen that before in, in finals with first time finalists where they just, you know, by the time they sort of got into their groove, it's a set and a bit down and it's, they're just, is too far gone so it's going to be interesting to see how she handles the occasion but I think she's very level-headed and she's got a very um focused like demeanor and I I think a really healthy attitude to the game so 
I think that's going to make for, I think it's going to be a very interesting final. They have played before and Mukova has beaten Triontech. This was in 2019 at the Prague Open. So prior to Iga kind of breaking through and winning slams. But I think she's got the game to really challenge Triontech, who hasn't been at her absolute best. So, um, but, you know, Triontech's one of those players that, like you said, on, on her day in the final can just pull out, you know, a champion's performance when it matters most. And that is what, you know, does elevate those top players and the world number ones from from the rest of the field. So she may very well have to dig deep and do that tomorrow. Um, I'm quite curious as well to see if Chris Everett's going to be calling uh, Mukova Mahova because that's what I was hearing on the commentary the other day. And I was like, have I been saying Carolina Mukova's name wrong this whole time? Um, and that kind of confused me a bit. I don't know if any of our listeners picked up on that one as well. It was a bit odd, wasn't it? I do think it's a bit like, um, you know, Greg Rosetsky and Djokovic. Djokovic, you know, you, oh. That was a classic. That was actually quite grating listening to that at the time when he was really commentating an awful lot. And it was an odd one, but I do think it's a slightly uh, less harsh C than maybe we go for mm. having listened to her. What a few videos as to how she says her name. Um but I, I do think that we can universally say that I think Chris Everett went too soft with the C when the C was missing <laughs> um, in that sense. But I do think um, on, on the topic that you just mentioned about the fact they are very different characters. I think Iga is almost uh, uh, not one of the most calm people, we would say, in terms of the demeanor on the court, in terms of some of the preparation and the intensity. Um, whereas Mukova is, is very, very chill. And I think that's something we've seen throughout the whole tournament that even when she was saying how happy she was, she just she didn't look that happy. She looked just like she was just having a normal conversation. Like she hadn't necessarily um, made it to the Grand Slam final. I mean, her dreams are, are coming true, and I think that's something which hopefully will allow her to have that same sort of sense here that um, this is something where it is hers to, to make the moment. And I think um, not being someone who's easily kind of overwhelmed by things and takes things in your stride will, will really help because we don't want a repeat of. You know, as we talked about earlier, Casper versus Nadal, because um, that was a, a really, really one-sided affair. So that first set, I think, will be really important. Um, but if I have, I'm going to, are we going to do predictions, Kim? I think we should. Oh, we've got to. Absolutely. I mean, the finals tomorrow, we can't not predict, can we? Um, got, well, we can't say the same thing. So which way are we going, Kim? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to stick with my pre-tournament prediction that Igor Shontek is going to win. But I think it will be in three sets. I'd love that because I think that would be a really entertaining match because the way they both play, it'll be very physical. It'll be super, super, um, uh, super interesting from a variety perspective as well. I'm going to say two sets. Mukova. Ooh. Very, very tight. Maybe a 7-6, seven, 7-5 seven, yeah. sort of match. I think it's going to be very, very close sets. Um I think we could be in for a cracking final. I think it would certainly be a lot more competitive than last year. Uh, Sean Tech golf, but who knows? I mean, we've seen finals make uh, players crumble in their, you know, <laughs> in the wake of giants. It's, it's, players can sometimes be a very different kettle of fish when they get to a Grand Slam final. So um, it, it remains really can, to be seen. It, can change. it really can change your game, can't it? And mm. we've seen people just deer in the headlights. So fingers crossed, we get an epic. Hopefully she doesn't cramp uh, like Carlos. Um, yeah. I mean, talking of Carlos, uh, obviously he'll be feeling quite down this evening, but we obviously do have a final um, to come. And, and obviously for some fans, it's not the player they, they wanted, but we do have Kasper Ruud against Novak Djokovic. So we should really predict an outcome for that one as well. Um, I've, I'm still saying Djokovic in straight sets. Uh, I think it's going to be very comfortable, but are you daring to go any different to that, Chris? I normally like to do something a bit different, but I, you can't bet against Djokovic in that situation. You, you really would mm. um, be pushing it there, I think. But hopefully hopefully a set would go, maybe four sets I'd like to see, but I do think it'll be three. Yeah. Well, let's hope it's, uh, you know, a fun, a fun ent entertaining match, regardless with some high quality tennis. Um, looking at tomorrow's schedule, we do have that women's singles final not before three o'clock local time. Before that, we do have a Brit in a final. We've got Alfie Hewitt in the men's wheelchair singles final against Oda of Japan. So, um, you know, hopefully Hewitt can bring home a title for uh, Great Britain. 
We also have the men's doubles final uh, later in the day between Dodig and Krychek, uh Croatian of American pairing against uh, Gillen Vliegen of Belgium, unseeded pair. So that'll be, uh, I mean, I don't think either of them have won. I don't think Gil or Vliegen have won a slam before. So that'll be quite something if they manage to to bring the, the title home. Um, and then, yeah, some more legends going on tomorrow as well, if anyone's... Uh, in the grounds of Roland Garros and, and want to watch uh, Desi and Grosjean. Kleisters again, yeah. Radvanska's playing with Lindsay Davenport. That's that's a pretty cool pairing. Like the sound of that. Um, and then, yeah, last of all, actually, Chris, before we go, collector set update. We do have two players who are down to the final two. Uh, so Tom Bryant and Liz Curran, um, you are our final two. You are both competing in the tie break and we have a question for you. Um, we'll let you know directly as well, just in case on the very slim chance you're not listening to this, of course. Um, but tie break question, Chris, would you like to reveal what the tie break question will be for Collect Set? Well, true to our normal question, we will be asking the number of games the losing men's finalist will win. And so this is not the women's final. It's just the men's final. And it's how many games the losing finalists will win. So however you want to try and figure that one out. Um, and if you'd like to play along at home, please do also have a little guess. That means that they you are guessing that the person who has not won it. And so I say, Kim, last year, given the numbers, you only had to count to six if this, if this was the tie break. So we'll be interesting to see what comes back. Because if you think it's going to go five sets, you can get some very high numbers. Hmm, have a think yeah Tom and Liz who's going to win out the two of you um, we'll be announcing obviously the winner of, of that and we'll be rounding up all of the finals action uh, on Sunday uh, here at Tennis Weekly HQ uh, but listeners I hope you've enjoyed our latest episode of the Tennis Weekly podcast remember to subscribe to us to stay up to date on all of the action still to come from the French Open we do have a couple more days still to play we're on Apple Podcasts Spotify and all major podcasts podcasting platforms out there and if you like what you're hearing then make sure to leave us a rating and a review on apple podcasts or spotify you can also follow us on social media and email the show we're on facebook instagram twitter youtube and now tiktok and on all of those channels we're tennis weekly pod you can also email the show tennis weekly pod at gmail.com or check out our website tennisweekly.co.uk and we will all be back, including Joel, uh, on Sunday at Tennis Weekly HQ for our Roland Garros finals catch up. So I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from myself. And we will see you again soon.